coming tonight. Um, you've probably read most of my uh, background here, but if you haven't, I retired from Ozaki Sheriff at the end of uh, 2015. I'd spent about 36 years there, 25 as a lieutenant. Most of my experience comes from our county uh, drug task force and our detective bureau, but I did some other things. And uh, one thing led to another, and I was fortunate enough to be able to retire from there and start a few days later at Concordia. So uh, that's kind of where I come from. And uh, one of the, uh, some of the things, you know, that we're going to talk about and that this presentation is about tonight. First of all, campus safety office, starting all the way from the top, our vice president, Steve Taylor, our director, Mario Valdez, and our staff are committed to the safety of our faculty, staff, and students, first and foremost. Uh, it becomes a little more challenging when we're talking about centers all over the state because we're not here if an event happens. So you have to typically rely more on your law enforcement agencies in an emergency. But there are a lot of other things that you can certainly consult with us. We can do things like this. Hopefully in the future after we get everybody kind of up to speed with um, the craze theories, philosophies, uh, we can actually maybe do some drilling. So uh, we'll look look forward to doing something like that uh, in the months to come. Uh, first of all, knowing your environment. Where's your closest exit? What kind of door do you have? Does it lock? Doesn't it lock? Um, what to do in, in an uh, active shooter or other type of emergency? Being prepared. If you're prepared, you planned, you've thought about this, you have the right mindset, you're going to be more likely to survive. It's really that simple. And hopefully as we go through the presentation tonight, you'll see some examples of that. Okay, you'll see the difference between back in 1999 when it first happened at Columbine and how they weren't prepared and how law enforcement's changed, our society's changed, and what we should be prepared for today. Um, you should, hopefully, you'll, uh, our discussion will help you realize what's needed to both survive an active shooter event and potentially able to help the university manage a crisis should it happen. One of the, uh, you know, one of the things that we hear a lot and it's just a part of human nature, in my opinion, is that, uh, you know, it just ain't going to happen here. You know, it, it just, you, you know, it, it's not going to happen to me. Well, when myself and a couple others went to the uh, FBI's active shooter uh, conference uh, last February, um, one of the speakers that they had was a man who lost his 15, 16 year old daughter who went to Platte Canyon High School. And that's in Colorado, very rural area near Columbine. I think it's an adjacent county to the county that Columbine was in. The largest population on any given day at, in this county was 450 people at the high school. That's how rural it was. You know, does anybody think that that's the kind of place it's going to happen? And it did. It can happen in places like this. It can happen here. Civilian response to active shooter events. That's what CRAE stands for. The FBI developed it along with the uh, Texas State University. Um, two other campus safety officers and myself uh, attended the, the training so that we're certified craze presenters. Um, hopefully you'll learn some things that might save your life should you get caught in an active shooter event, whether it be teaching here at Concordia, whether it be in your courtroom, you know, whether it be at the shopping mall, 
uh, an office environment, the grocery store. The things we're going to talk about today can apply to any environment in any day of your life. So, um, and the other thing is uh, to think about is if you're ever caught, something happens, coming from law enforcement, it's really important that you understand what law enforcement might do and how you should react to that, okay? So that we don't have the good guys end up having something bad happen because of uh, something that could have been avoided. I have to give a little disclaimer. The, uh, this audio, some of the other video, could be, in certain people's cases, a little graphic for them, okay? Um, it can be disturbing because you're hearing, in this particular case, from a teacher at the time on a 911 call. And it's, uh, I don't think it's anything that you don't hear or see on any given day watching television. But if you think it's going to bother you, uh, feel free. Uh, feel free to step out. Uh, I'll tell you about the videos before I talk about them in this, so you have an opportunity to do that if you want. One particular event that really changed the way that law enforcement responds to an active shooter was Columbine in 1999. Back then, law enforcement's uh, protocols was a very slow, uh, tactical um, response. Set up a perimeter, get your tactical team in place. Often, many agencies, like the one I came from, didn't, our tech team wasn't on all the time. We, we had a handful of officers that might have been on the SWAT team that ended up could respond, but by the time you got tactical there, uh, you know, not unusual for a half an hour or longer to go by easy. So that was kind of the response in Columbine back in 1999. And it really changed the way they respond because now, and s since then, it's kind of been evolving to a point where we have quick, rapid response teams. Law enforcement trains together. Agencies throughout any given county will train. They're all pretty much training on the FBI's alert program. And, you know, it's a rapid response. One, two guys get there. They go directly to the threat, no matter what else is happening. Uh, so much different because that time, and you'll see this throughout the program, time equals casualties. The more time that goes by, the higher the body count, and that's typically what the, uh, the, the shooter is looking for. Um, some of the things I want you to listen for, this is about a four minute uh, audio of a 911 call between Patty Nelson, who was in the library, the teacher that was in the library at the time, okay? And, you know, I'm gonna be critical of what happened, only from the perspective that we need to do better than that now, okay? Back then, you could understand it. They didn't train, active shooter wasn't on the news every day. Patty Nelson could not have expected to go to work on that day thinking that two murderers were going to walk into the high school and start executing people, all right? I don't know that we can say that today. Can we expect that not to happen here? We can certainly hope it happens. We can pray that it don't happen. But we should be prepared if it does. And I think what this, this audio will do will help you understand what they didn't do in 1999 that we should be doing in 2017. Um, couple things to listen for. There's uh, a number of times where the, the dispatcher is asking Patty if she can do some certain things. And Patty doesn't want to, okay? Patty's never thought about this before. Patty hasn't had craze training, all right? So Patty's like, I, I can't do that, all right? 
but you'll see what happens as a result of not being able to uh, do that. So play the tape. Jefferson County 911. Yes, I am a teacher at Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. He has shot out a window. I believe one student has been shot. Um, um, I've been Columbine High School. I don't know what's in my shoulder. If it was just the last thing to do what. Um, okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the school is in a panic. And I'm in the library. I've got students down under the table, kids. Kids under the table. Um, kids are screaming. Some of the teachers um, are, you know, trying to take control of things. We need police here. We need okay. Police. We're getting them there. Police here. Who is the student, ma'am? I do not know who the student is. Okay. I saw a student outside. I was in hold and audio gun. Okay. I was on hold and I saw a gun. I said, what's going on out there? And they said, oh, it's probably for video protection. It's probably a joke. I said, well, I don't think that's a good idea. And I went walking outside. I think he was down. <laughs> See what was going on. He turned the gun straight at us and shot. And my God, the window went out. And the kid standing there with me, the, I think he got hit. Okay. Something in my shoulder. Okay. We've got help on the way, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Oh, God. Stay in the line with me. Oh, God. Okay. Just stay down. Do we know where he's at? I'm sorry? Do we know where he's at? He, okay. I'm in the library. He's upstairs. He's right outside of here. He's outside? He's outside of this hall. Outside of a hall? Or outside of the hall. Outside okay. Of the there are alarms and things going off. There's smoke. My God, smoke is like coming into this room. Okay. okay. I've got the kids under the table here. I don't know what's happening in the rest okay. of the building. Okay. There's also smoke in the building. I don't know. I'm sure someone has to be calling 911 to say. Yes. We've got a lot of people on. Okay. I just want you to stay in the line with me. Like We need to know what's going on. Okay. Okay. I am on the floor. Okay. And you've okay. got the kids the there. Library. And I've got every student in this library on the floor. You better stay on the floor. Is there any way you can lock the doors? Um, smoke is coming in from out there, and I'm a little okay. The gun is right outside the library door, okay? I don't think I'm going to go out there. Okay, you're okay. calling my high school? I got, I got three children. Okay, we got it. Okay? Um, I'm not going to go to the door to shut the, the door, okay? I've got the kids on the floor. Um, I've got all the kids in the library on the floor. We have paramedics, we have fire, and we have police on route, okay, sir? Okay. Okay. Yes. This, I mean, Bye. he's, I, I don't know, this, this, I can't believe he's not out of the woods. He just keeps shooting and shooting and shooting. Okay. Yeah, we've got a police officer on scene. Him. I thought it was. Okay, just try and keep the kids in the library calm. Yeah. Is there any way you can block the door so no one can get in? I do, I do not. Okay. I, yeah, I guess I can try to go, but I mean, he's right outside that door. I'm afraid to go to the That's okay. That's where he is. I'm not okay. to go there. Okay. That's okay. Okay, I told the kids to get on the floor. I had to go under the table. All of the children are on the floor under the table. Um, um, yeah, they're all under the table. Okay. And, and I as long as we can just try and keep... No one's saying a word. Okay, as long as we can keep everyone there as calm as we can. I hear some yelling out there going on right yeah, now. Yeah, we've got alarms going off now as well. Yeah, there's one. This room is filled with smoke. Okay. Okay. Keep everyone low to the floor. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's up. Okay. Everyone stay on the floor. Stay on the floor. Stay under the table. Okay. Um, okay. I... I don't know. I, it's okay. I know. Just I don't know. I didn't. I said, what? What is that kid got? He was outside at the time, and 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 um, I was on call duty. Oh God! And he, he's crying. He's like, woo woo woo! I know. Those things are, are being shot off. I do not know who the student was. I don't even think I saw him. He's wearing black. He didn't look very large. Um, it's a male student. Um, he was out there shooting. It looked like he was pointing out and shooting. And somebody, I said, yeah. what is that? Mm -hmm. I said, what's going on out there? It's a very cat gun. It's totally for video production. You know, they do these videos. Right. And, and the kids, the kids I said, well, that's not, you know, a play gun, a real gun. I was going out there to say no. Mm -hmm. And I went, well, I said, oh, my God, that was really close. That just rattled me. Okay. What's your name, ma'am? Patty? I don't I don't know about you, but listening to that really it it it, it drives me nuts, okay? Especially 
those law enforcement people that might be in here, think about how long that conversation was. It was almost four minutes, right? What was said that helped anybody survive that? I don't, I don't know if there's one thing in there that helped the cops responding, that helped save those kids. Those kids had options. There was ways to escape. There was ways to barricade the doors. There was ways to defend themselves. But back then, I don't. Well, you know, I yeah, the 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 whole the whole conversation between the dispatcher and Patty sounded like some phone call between, you know, two friends the next day after something happened and and it accomplished nothing. So my point being is this is where we were at in nineteen ninety nine. And hopefully where we're at today where we take other precautions, education, training, preparation, you'll see where we should be. The uh, Avoid, Deny, Def the Avoid, Deny, Defend uh, program is going to be st stressed throughout this presentation, okay? And following this, I'm going to play about a 13-minute video that was produced by the FBI and Walmart. It does a very, very nice job of explaining uh, these options and why they make sense and things like that. Avoid basically means get away from the threat. If you have an opportunity, first and foremost, get away from the threat, okay? You're not going to die if he can't see you. That's, that, that's probably not even a good choice of words. He's not, you're not going to die if you're not there, all right? So think about where you're at, where your exits are, what your options are to get out, first and foremost. Secondly, that might not be an option, all right? We might be here right now and hear gunshots right out in the hall. Or maybe f down the hall enough that, hey, nope, I ain't going out there. Deny means deny the threat access to your location. And, and we'll talk more about different ways to do that. That's one of the things, if you have a chance afterwards, we'll talk about doors. We'll talk about a simple um, wedge that usually holds a door open, but can in turn be used to keep it shut. Do your doors lock? Do they swing in? Do they swing out? What do you have in here to barricade? All those different types of things. Things that, you know, to be quite frank, I never thought about until I started this. So uh, those are, that's what you want uh, to do. Secondly, if you can't get out, then I and lastly, defend. And the question is really, do you want to die or do you want to survive? And I'll show you some examples, but it's a mindset, okay? If you have the mindset, you have the opportunity to defend yourself, okay? So I think the video probably uh, does a better job of showing and explaining it than I'll do, so we'll get to that. Was the volume okay? There's a gunman inside the store. We need help now. Thank you. 
We need help. There's a gunman inside the store. He's shooting the place up. We need help now. Issues that we found. Okay, Emily, see what that is. See what's going on. Just let us know what you find. There you go. <laughs> You're safe for that. There's a guy with the gun. He's shooting. Look. James, what do I have to do? No, look. Run. 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 To the right. To the right. To the loading dock. Come on. This way. This way. This way. Oh, no. Come in. Yeah. yeah. In here. In here. The gunman's coming. What are we going to do? We're going to have to defend ourselves. I, I, I can't do this. You're going to see your daughter tonight, OK? We are all going to go home tonight, all right? We have a right to defend ourselves. Get the gun! Get the gun. Hey. Hold him down, hold him down. If you ever have the misfortune to be in an active shooter event, you deserve to survive. In our research, we have found that the actions that potential victims take during these events are critical to their survival. We have identified three options that have proven effective in many events. These are, avoid the attacker. Deny the attacker access to your area. Defend yourself. It is a personal decision, but you have a right to do so. Avoiding the attacker starts with being aware of your surroundings at all times and knowing what is going on around you. If you see or hear something that looks suspicious, take action. For example, the stalker took immediate and effective action to protect himself when he observed the shooter pulling out weapons from the bag. Others, however, hesitated, and this hesitation can cost them valuable time that they could have used to get away from the threat. If you hear something that is, or could be, gunfire, start trying to get away from it as soon as possible. Gunfire has a distinctive sound. Inside of buildings, the sound can be muffled or distorted. A single loud bang could be a person dropping something, or even thunder. But repeated loud bangs are much more likely to be gunfire. Additionally, look at the reaction of others. Are they startled or scared? Are they running? What are they saying? Any one of these events individually may create denial, but when put together, should create a heightened awareness and stimulate an immediate response. It is important that you know how to get out. The situation will be chaotic and rapidly changing. 
In general, you will want to go to the nearest exit. But you must also understand that the closest exit may not be accessible or safe to use. If this is the case, go to a different exit. While avoiding the threat, consider the uses of cover and concealment. Cover offers protection from gunfire, while concealment minimizes your exposure to the attacker. Try to keep objects between you and the attacker. If you can't avoid the attacker, sometimes the best option will be to deny the attacker access to your location. In many locations, this can be accomplished by closing and locking a door, such as they did in the meeting room. Locking the door has proven effective in many attacks. If the door does not have a lock, you can place heavy objects in front of it. Remember, barricades work best if the door opens toward you. If it doesn't, use things that are readily available, such as straps, belts, or objects that can be used to block or secure the door to make it difficult for the attacker to enter the room. This may at least slow the attacker down and give you time to identify alternate means of escape, such as adjoining rooms or windows. When attempting to deny access to your location, you want to make it appear that there is no one in your area. Lock doors, turn off the lights, silence your phones, and get out of sight. Your attempt to deny the attacker access to your location might fail. The gunman's coming. What are we going to do? We're going to have to defend ourselves. Have a backup plan about what you will do. In many cases, this may be to defend yourself. You need to be in a place where you can act if the attacker comes into your location. In most rooms, you will line up against the same wall that the door is on, near the door so you can react, but not directly in front of it. If you are unable to avoid or deny, your best option may be to defend yourself by using whatever is available. In a situation where someone is attempting to kill you, you have the legal right to defend yourself. Attack weak spots such as eyes, throat, and groin. Fight to the best of your ability and do not quit until the attacker is stopped. Get the gun. This is what the workers in the warehouse did when they were unable to avoid the attacker and felt their lives were in immediate danger. Whatever option you choose, call 911 as soon as you are in a safe location. Provide any information that you know. The operator will ask you a lot of questions. If you don't know the answer, don't guess. Just say you don't know and only state the facts. This will be a complex situation and we can't tell you what you should do in every case. What we can do is provide you with information about the options that we have found to be most effective for surviving these attacks. The ultimate choice is yours. What you do matters. Avoid the attacker. Deny access to your location. Defend yourself. Law enforcement will be entering a chaotic scene with limited information. Their first priority will be to stop the threat to your safety. The police may not know where or who the threat is. Listen and comply with their commands immediately. Put it down, put it down, sir. Put it down, both of you on the ground. Police are trained to look at people's hands to assess threats. Do not have anything in your hands that could be perceived as a weapon, such as a cell phone. Show me your hands, sir. Show me your hands. Move to us. Everybody, keep your hands up, please. Walk out the door. If told to do so, stay where you are and do not make sudden movements. Again, follow all commands. Remember, what you do matters. Avoid the attacker. Deny access to your location. Defend yourself. Remember, A-D-D, -D, you can survive. I think that's a, a really good video. Um, I think it explains the, the basic principles of 
you know, what you, the options that you have, uh, the choices that you have if you're caught in that kind of a situation. Um, it is uh, posted on the CRW portal. So feel free to uh, use it, share it, uh, show it to your classes if you want. Uh, we are working on a, um, uh, we are working on a, um, putting something out for all the professors to go over with their classes like each start of each new class. It may be part of our emergency action guide. I don't, I don't see, you don't have them here at the center, so that's something we'll look at. But uh, it may be something as simple as this. So um, it's out there for to share with whoever you want. There's a couple things in the, uh, the last video that I thought uh, probably weren't addressed by the video, but they were there, okay? And it's mindset. Uh, when when the, the, uh, sh the stalker and the lady and the other guy, they run, they get into that aisle, okay? And what is the first thing that she says? Right, right. So what do you think her mindset was? This is over, game's up, I'm dead, okay? And then the other guy, he turns around and says, you're gonna go, we're gonna go home tonight. We have the right to defend ourselves. So you kind of see both ends of the spectrum there. You got the person who thinks huh, it's over. You got the other guy says, not happening. We're, we're, we're gonna do something about it. This is a uh, floor plan of the station nightclub in West War Warwick, Rhode Island. And it was a site of a terrible fire about 10 or 12 years ago where there was a concert there and about 100 people ended up dying in the fire. Um, the thing, the reason I'm showing this is it's more about some of these people you'll see, it, it didn't matter what they did. But better awareness of your environment, just taking a few minutes when you go somewhere to look around and say, you know, okay, if something happens, that's the way I'm going. As a cop, you know, we always get used to, we go in a restaurant and we sit with our back in the corner, all right, because we want to be able to see what's going on. And, you know, it's just a little bit of our training and our background came into play in those types of things. And hopefully that's some of what you'll get tonight. Okay, I'm going into a restaurant. If something happens, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? All right. Notice that there's four different exits. This is the main entrance where everybody came in. There's an exit two and three over here. Another exit here. This is where the band's playing. This is where the fire starts. This is where most of your people are. There's windows here. My, my point being there's other options. But when we watch this video, again, it's, it's a little graphic. You're gonna hear people that are screaming and being trampled to death. That's gonna bother you. Feel free to step out.
just how bad the smoke is. Minute and a half later. This is the uh, law enforcement agency's diagram after, and the, the circles with the numbers are where the bodies were found after the fire. And you can see where you have 31, 18, and 9, all going back to that place where they came in. And you, can, you could talk for hours about what happens to people's brains when you get into a panic mode, and that might be tough to change. And certainly some of these people had no choice. But what you realize is how many, how many people actually didn't get out where they could have possibly escaped. They didn't break windows out because very likely, not to be critical of them, I mean, there's probably all kinds of building code violations. They were, I believe they were like double their capacity. So there's a lot of things that led to it. But had they went in there and thought about, where do I get out of here if something happens? Who knows? There might have been less casualties. That's the only point. This is what, where we don't want to be, OK? We don't want to hide and hope. And I think as we go forward, I'm going to show you some slides and talk about the Virginia Tech shooting that shows why this strategy is a death strategy. There's nothing in this room, there's no desk made that I know that's going to stop a bullet or prevent someone from walking around. Boom, boom. Th think about this, okay? We, we have, what, 30? people roughly here right now. Think about if somebody walks in that door right now, all right, and we decide we're all going to hide under these tables. But we're all going to go over in that corner because he's right outside the door and turn the lights off and hope he doesn't come in and find us, right? Because that's what they used to do. You know, no, no fault of their own. I asked my 11-year-old granddaughter the other day, who goes to a small Lutheran school after I came back from this conference. I said, what do they teach you? Well, we turn off the lights, we shut the door, and we hide in the corner. OK. You turn off the lights, you go make yourselves a very easy target so that the killer can stack up his body count, because that's what it's doing. Now think about our options here other than that. How many weapons are in the room? I'm not asking if anybody has any guns or knives, OK? How, how, many, how many weapons are in this room? You know, there's, there's a lot of them, all right? Some better than others, but at least there's something. There's chairs, there's tables, there's computers, there's speakers, there's stuff hanging on the wall. And we've got them outnumbered. Very few active shooter events ever have more than one shooter. Very, very, very few. So the option of hiding and hoping versus avoid, deny, defend. This is uh, Norris Hall. It was a, the scene of the mask here at Virginia Tech back in 2007. All right. And I think when you're all done with this, I hope that it makes a little sense why avoid, deny, defend is something that we should think about, something we should prepare ourselves for. The, uh, the thing to note is the killer at Virginia Tech already killed two people before he went to Norris Hall. So what happens when two people get killed at a university? A lot of cops come, you know, pretty significant.
police presence on the campus because they had already discovered two bodies, right? It didn't do them a bit of good, okay? And you'll see in the end what did do some of them good. Not hiding, hoping and uh, that law enforcement or campus safety is gonna come and save you, but avoiding, denying, and defending. That's what saved the lives of the ones who survived. Section four could look like any hallway down in Mequon or here or anywhere else that you might be. Uh, remember, and you'll, you'll hear it in a video of, of a young lady that survived it, you know. He went around and he chained the door shut. Uh, so, you know, access became difficult. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of physical things we can do construction-wise and that type of thing to make sure that that doesn't happen. I, I remember years ago when I was in school, they used to chain the doors shut at night, so they'd just leave them hang there, right? Well, you gave them the lock and the chain to do it with. We don't do that anymore. This is uh, Christina Anderson. She was in room 211 at Virginia Tech when the shooting started. She played dead. She was uh, shot a total of three times. Uh, once he came in, he started shooting people, shot her, went, went left, came back, started finishing people off. So I think he shot her two more times after that. So you're gonna see why playing dead isn't a good strategy. So this is pretty important. This day, I ended up sitting in exactly the same seat I always did, in the back right-hand corner on the right side of the class. What we don't know is that this time, someone is downstairs, and he's chaining all three doors shut. There are supposed to be desks there. All you guys can see. We heard the first gunshots outside in the hallway, and my teacher, she opened the door. She immediately slammed it, and she said, call 911. And the second that door closed, he walks in. He walks in shooting. There's absolutely no time. He goes to the other side of the classroom by the windows. He's holding two guns. He doesn't say anything. He just starts going down the rows of people. It's very quick. It's very loud. It's very scary. We had these very shitty desks. I get on the floor. I put my knees under the chair, my stomach on the seat, hands overhead, eyes are closed. As the shots keep going, and it's, like I said, very loud, I can tell it's getting closer and closer. And I'm telling myself, brace yourself, your turn is gonna come. Now, I didn't know what that meant. Like, I didn't think I was gonna get shot, but I knew that something really serious was going on. And I knew for whatever reason that I should just play dead. He shoots me. The first time's in the back. And you'd be surprised, getting shot doesn't hurt that much because shock overtakes you, but it starts to like burn and really kind of seep in and that's when it gets really uncomfortable. Um, it's not pleasant. He leaves the first time. He goes across the hall. And while he's gone, cell phones are ringing. People are coughing. And the smell of gunpowder has, like, completely filled the room. Gunpowder is like this really sticky, pungent, warm smell. And it just makes you very, very thirsty. He comes back. Now, this time, the shooting is more intermittent. It's slower because he's looking to see who's alive. I remember telling myself to stop breathing because I can feel my stomach hitting that chair. And I'm saying, stop, like, he can see that you're alive. The third and final time, he killed himself in front of our classroom. When the police broke in, the first thing the guy said was, we have a lot of blacks in here. I didn't know what that meant, but when police sweep a crime scene, they have 30 seconds. If you're red, you're critically injured. If you're yellow, you'll live. Black means you're dead. In nine minutes, he killed 11 of my classmates and my teacher. 32 people lost their lives that day. There's a couple interesting things that she says, and I don't, I don't uh, profess to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist or anything like that, but I, I, I am going to give you my opinion on, on why I think she said that, okay? She says, we had these very shitty desks. Are you thinking, what, what does that mean, right? I think it means she thinks that's where she's supposed to be safe. 
that my desk is going to save. If I hide under my desk, I'm good, right? No, when you hide under your desk, you're going to get shot. So that's the attitude, though. That's, a, that's where we were, even in 2007, that we shouldn't and can't be in 2017. She also says, you know, when we talk about mindset, she said something about, you know, he's getting closer and closer, and I told myself to, you know, brace, brace yourself, and my time was coming, but I didn't think I was going to die. Well, when you're laying under a desk or sitting under a desk, and a guy's going around executing your classmates, you know, she made a choice. She made a choice to play dead, that might have saved her life at that point. I'm not going to second guess it. I haven't been in her, her shoes. But I certainly wouldn't want our kids today thinking that it's okay to hide under your desk and play dead. Because it usually leads to, to you being a casualty. <coughs> This is just the, uh, the room layout of uh, the different rooms that the shooter attacked uh, on the, the day that uh, committed these crimes. These are the room numbers on the bottom. And these uh, bars are the percentage, yellow is a percentage of people shot in that room, and the red is a percentage of those shot that were killed, okay? So, room 206, that's where the shooting started. The shooter walked in and started killing people. He left and returned later to shoot more. Here's what I don't know. How many of these were shot and how many died the first time? Because they didn't have a lot of chance. They could have potentially could have defended throwing chairs, desks, that kind of thing, but that didn't happen. So we don't know. But I'll venture to say that by doing nothing after he leaves, that he came back and he created more casualties because nobody avoided, nobody denied, and nobody defended. Room 211, the teacher heard shots and told the students to call 911. She attempted to block the door with their desk. Okay. The shooter pushed his way in, shot the professor, walked down the aisle killing students. The re shooter returned later and shot more students. So, even though there was a little bit of an attempt to barricade, he got in. I don't believe, from listening to Christina, that anybody was in a defending mode. You had 20, 30 kids in a class. I, I'm, I'm just guessing. I don't have the information on that. But it doesn't sound like anybody was engaging the shooter throwing stuff at him, yelling, running, trying to get out, whatever, okay? So he had extremely high success rate, number of people shot, a little less percent, but he's, he's still at, you know, 68% or so of the people he shot killed. How many of them got killed when he came back? That potentially, if they had time, that they possibly could have went in barricaded the door better, did whatever, and you'll see what some of the others do and you'll see what the point is in the end. Two oh seven was the uh, the shooter walked in, shot several students and the teacher. He then walked down the aisle shooting students. So that that kind of suggested that same mentality of we we're trying to hide Turn their bodies to barricade the door. Shooter got the door open an inch 
and fired several shots into the doorknob, but no one was hit by these shots. So, do I know for certain? No, I wasn't there. But he gets in, he has a fairly high success rate of the number of people he shoots. He's in the 85%, right? Up to that point, there had been nothing done. He leaves, he comes back, but guess what? By this time, we're barricading the door, okay? And look at where your kill rate is down to 30-some percent. I would venture to say barricading the door probably kept that rate down. It kept them from finishing them off. Room 204, there's a professor that was a Holocaust survivor. He held the door shut when the shooter tried to enter. We talked about a wedge, right? Well, any of you know anything about firearms? You can shoot through a door. But I guess holding is better than nothing, but you know, you got the one. So, what does a wedge do? It gets you out of the, out of the way, okay? Uh, held the door shut when the shooter tried to enter. He yelled at his students to jump out the windows. Okay, good. We got a void started, right? Get out of here. The shooter shot him through the door, killing him. Ten students made it out the windows before the shooters got in. That's ten more and made it out of any other room, isn't it? Two more were shot trying to get out. Both survived. Of the six who did not get out, four were shot, and one of those shot died. So, the way I look at this is, you started to deny with the professor, he defeated that, but we weren't hiding under the desk, were we? We are getting out the windows, okay? So, percentage of people shot, percentage of people killed down because you had successful avoiding the attacker. Room 205, there's no graph. That's because the students heard the shots and used their feet to keep the door closed. The shooter pushed on and fired through the door but never gained entry. Probably not the best way to barricade the door they're probably lucky in one, one hand that firing through the door didn't hit any of them. But what did they do? They denied him access. And by denying him access, how many of them got shot and how many of them died? None. So I think you can see where we were in 1999 with Columbine and where we need to be today, 2017. One more thing, I, uh, one other thing I want to talk about, which I've mentioned a few times, is mindset. All right? And this is Brian Murphy. He was a lieutenant at Oak Creek Police when they had the Sikh uh, Temple shooting a few years ago. And uh, Lieutenant Murphy was shot like 15, 17 times, something like that. Okay? And, you know, when you get shot that many times, somebody's looking out for you. But he had a mindset. And this is what he said afterwards. And he, he was at the conference that uh, we went to and spoke. And he says, I'm not going out in a parking lot. I'm not going out like this. I'm not going to let my wife down. I'm not going to let my daughter down and I'm not letting my stepkids down. Did Brian get lucky? It wasn't his day, but did his mindset have something to do with that? Uh, could he have laid down and gave up, had the shooter come? I mean, if you see the video of 
different things that he did even after he had been shot multiple times, all right, because he wanted to survive. It's not the lady in the aisle saying, I ain't going home tonight. He's saying, I am going home tonight. And I think it makes a difference. The question is, hopefully after tonight, you have the right mindset. Because what you do matters. And preparedness equals survival. And I hope that that starts today.